Welcome to Old Path Ministries and our study through the book of 2 Corinthians. We get to chapter 4 today, and uh, I think I made mention of it during the uh, the Samuel study, if you're watching both the Old and New Testament. Um, we're still uh, kind of digging out from that cold uh, front that had come through, or those days that we had of really cold here in Texas. So my, uh, my daughter and son-in-law and my grandchildren are staying with us, and so every once in a while you might... In the background here, a, uh, a baby or a three-year-old making a bunch of noise downstairs. So um, I just had to pause a moment ago uh, because the, the noise was so loud downstairs. So I uh, hope it's not too distracting if you get it, but that will explain what you're hearing in the background. So chapter four, when we get to, to Paul's writing here, uh, whether it's Corinthians or any of his other books, there are times when he starts to talk to you about his own life and what it's been ever since God had laid hold of him to put him into ministry and the, the kind of persecution and trouble that he has uh, has endured up to this point and will it, it, indeed for the rest of his life. It just tells you what a different life it would be for him versus us here in the West. Now, there may be people watching this video here that are watching it in some part of the world that uh, it really is a, a real challenge persecution-wise to live where you do. And uh, I don't want to minimize that. But when I read the things like what Paul will say here, it just helps me to understand how very different his life would have been and, and really all of the believers at the time. Um, we know that, that uh, martyrdom was pretty much what awaited most of them if we believe the history that's been given to us um, from the, that first century. But it wasn't an easy life without question. We, are, we have it chronicled here for us what Paul's life was like. So the first six verses that we're going to look at this, the, this time here are really kind of, they belong better with chapter 3. Verse 7 really kind of has a, a difference in the topic that goes on. So we'll, we'll get to that break here in just a moment. But it's pretty well accepted and it's, I think it's pretty obvious from the uh, the kinds of things that Paul ends up saying, there is somewhat of a defense that he ends up giving in uh, in uh, about his ministry, about who he is, and uh, who they are because of his ministry. He doesn't take credit for it himself, but it's as though he's answering critics in in much of this book, especially in the opening chapters, and so. If that was really the reason why he wrote what he wrote, it very much helps us understand why he's making the arguments. And this is important as far as understanding when we study through the Bible. We're able to see that there are some things usually implied. If he's having to give correction about particular topics, why is he doing it to one particular church as he would write it in an epistle? Well, that would be pretty obvious, and, and common sense would tell you, well, you address a problem because the problem exists. So if Paul is making a defense for who he is and for what his ministry is and who they are to him and who he is to them, those kinds of things, it should be pretty obvious to us that this must be addressing things that had been going on there at Corinth. And we do know this from all of, uh, well, not all, but most of Paul's writings Somewhere in the epistle, you're going to find that there were people that were coming around, that were coming behind him and casting doubt on his ministry, saying things about, about him and his authority. It seemed to be kind of a, a normal thing. He, he would refer to them as Judaizers um, or people that were trying to get them to come back under the law. I mean, Galatians, the book of Galatians is written almost exclusively because of that. So with that said... Put yourself in the position, if you're trying to come in and undermine the work of Paul, what are some of the best ways that you could do it? Well, these would here would be some just off the top of my head, and you could probably tell that that may have very well been what was going on here by his arguments. But if I'm trying to make a case against him, it's like, yeah, well, Paul had a pretty interesting occasion, something that he says happened to him on the road to Damascus, but... You know, the thing is, he's trying to, to take you away from what God has told his people that they're supposed to do. So if you're a Judaizer, you're going to say, it's okay that you believe in Jesus, but there are elements of the law that you should still hold on to. So for whatever reason, these people would come in behind him. Now, I, again, I believe that they're stirred by the devil to do so because it really damages the potential is that it damages the message of Paul cast doubt on him and who he is. 
probably they could have gone as far as to say he's still pretending to be something that he's actually not. They would they would maybe lack his or, or uh, call that the things that he does really is a kind of a lack of sincerity. He's just doing it because there's something in it for him. And so, you know, th those kinds of things are taking place. You see it in these first six verses. He seems to address those types of matters. So let's get to the text. We'll start at verse one. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you would give us your assistance by the Holy Spirit to help us to understand what we read and why it's important. Are these things happening in our modern day that we're able to make application? And should we be wary of the idea that uh, that there are people who would, would come to look to undo the work of that that uh, that saving work that began in us by the Holy Spirit, or casting doubt on the word, the things that we read. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to see that you have preserved your word perfectly and in its in its uh, entirety. May we be faithful to uh, apply what we hear and what we learn. We give you thanks and praise, and ask that you would be glorified in us in Jesus' name. All right. So verse four says, "Therefore." So. This may very well be why I put the, the chapter break here. Therefore, means that he's just made some type of, of a statement that he's wanting us to understand. Now, he's going to mention the unveiled face again here in chapter 4, but he's mentioned that a little bit earlier in, in the chapter 3, that Moses had to veil his face because of there, were, there was a glory that was kind of diminishing as time would go by. As he was in those times when, when he spoke with God, his face would radiate, and uh, and he didn't want people to see the the diminishing of that that glory that began to fade. There had always been the question of why was that, and then Paul makes it pretty clear why that was. Paul or uh, Moses hid his face because he didn't want people to see the fading away of that glory. And here Paul says, the glory that we have is is nothing of the sort. There it, it doesn't fade away because it's eternal. It's it's going to be forever. The work that Jesus did is not going to fade away to give way to something else. The law faded away because it gave way to the person of Jesus Christ. So that's already been covered. But we read in verse 17 and 18, Now the Lord is the Spirit, is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the freedom that, that comes to the, to the believer, not only freedom from sin, but the freedom to operate in this life without the condemnation of sin. But we all, with unveiled face, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of God and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, so it just flows nicely into it. And remember, when Paul wrote this letter, there was no chapter 3 <clears throat> and there was no chapter 4. It's a continuing thought. So Paul is able to say, make an application. Therefore, since we have this ministry and we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, Paul, again, if this is given as a defense, which I believe that it is, he's having people more than likely casting doubt on the entirety of his ministry. And they might pick around the edges of things. Maybe a lack of sincerity. He tells you one thing, but he's going to actually do another. He's covered that in the first chapter. Wanted to come to you, wasn't able. <clears throat> so whatever it may be, his defense really kind of takes on maybe some of the critiques that people were making against him. So he says, we have this ministry. Now that ministry that's been given to him, he sees it. It's something that God had laid hold of him to do. And it was given to him as this ministry. It was different than what he would have ever done as a, as a a Jew that didn't know who Jesus was. So now he sees his task in this world as given to him by God directly. So we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. Now God's given him the ministry, has shown mercy to him. And so because of that, he's able to endure all of these kinds of things, whatever it may be. The hardship, the persecution, the backbiting, the fighting that goes on between people and all the rest of it. He says, I'm not... I'm not discouraged by these things. I don't lose heart. I don't become weary. So, <clears throat> verse 2, he says, But we, now this is by contrast, these unnamed people, it would seem as though the people that are coming in behind, that, behind him and saying the things that they're doing, or whatever's created this situation there in Corinth, the things that Paul says, here's what we have done, by implication, this is what they are doing in reverse. They're guilty of these things that we are not guilty of. And he goes through them. 
He says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame. And what would those be? I think it's because he kind of describes them a little bit. He says, we are not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Okay. So that must mean that the other people who are coming behind him, Paul said, look, I don't do things in the dark. I don't do things in the way of trying to subvert the work like those guys. In fact, he says, we don't do this. We're not crafty. We're not trying to figure out some angle. We're not being dishonest. And we are not handling the word of God in some way that it's a means to an end. That by implication means that the people who have said and made the charges against him, that's all of what they're doing. Here's what Paul says. Here's by contrast. He says, but here's what we do. By manifestation of the truth, we are commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's his way of saying, let God be our witness and let you guys look through it. Whatever the accusations are, find out if there's merit to them. Now, I really love the idea that he's able to do this. And I love this about uh, about Paul's ministry heart. And I'll tell you what, this would be really, really convicting to every person that ever calls themselves pastor or teacher. Would they be able to say in the in the sight of God, we will let anyone look at anything about any part of our ministry and find out that it is honest and it is genuine. God is our witness. And that's kind of his point here. They can make all the accusations that they want to, but there's no merit to them. And this is what the case that he's building. He says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled from those who are perishing. So if people are claiming that, well, Paul's got this exclusive kind of a, of a view that he's got it all figured out and nobody else does. Basically, he says, look, it's I don't have anything hidden. If it's veiled, if, if what we're preaching is somehow hidden from them. Remember, he's using the imagery from verse three or from chapter three where Moses had that veil. And he talks about that veil. It was literal with Moses, but it acts in much the same way as what happens with Jews when they hear the good news. It's like a veil over their face. It's hidden from their eyes. Here, Paul says, if ours is veiled, it's not veiled because of us. It's veiled because of their unwillingness to know the truth. They're blinded, as he says here, um, it is veiled uh, to those who are perishing. Now, that's a willful thing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded? So have you ever asked or ever thought to yourself, how is it that Maybe I'll talk to a group of people and all of them heard the exact same thing as I was, you know, witnessing to them and telling them about who God is and what he's done in my life and why it's important that they know what the Bible says about it. However you go about witnessing, how is it that it resonates with some and yet it seems like it's a foreign language to the other people? Maybe the same group of people all assembled at the same time and it has a totally different effect on a different person standing in the same group. This kind of explains a bit. He says, look, the gospel that we're teaching, the good news, it's open for everyone to hear it. Now, if it somehow seems hidden to some people, that's because they are perishing. And why are they perishing? They're dying in their sin. And why is that? It's because the the God of this age has blinded them who do not believe. And if they did, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, would shine upon them. So his point is, there's a blindness that's happened. Now, it's shown here as a blindness that is given to them by the enemy, but it's it's also one of those things that God will only hold people accountable, I believe, because all people have heard. So ultimately, the, the, the blame for their whatever happens with them eternally can only fall upon each individual person, or that starts to call into question that God's even just. If the devil wants them to not hear, then God is, is going to be at the point where the, the gospel is going to be hidden from people because he allowed the devil to hide it from them and they never had a chance to hear it. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that whosoever. And so if what Paul would say here is, look, the God of this age wants to blind them, but we also know that there are people, when you talk to them, they'll hear exactly what you're saying. It's not as though they don't understand the English. They don't want it because of, again, usually the consequences. Yeah, but if I do what you're saying, my whole life has to change and I have to reorder everything about what I believe. Well, yeah, exactly, because your life is a is in a place of rebellion and God's calling you to a place of, of coming to him and living in, in fellowship with him. Yeah, things are going to change. I know lots of people that I've met over the years that 
just don't want to have to do what it takes in order to walk rightly before God. They think they're giving things up for a life of, of you know, no fun, no, ex, no excess, no anything else. Okay. Those are silly reasons, but there's no merit to them. But it's what they want to believe. And here's the, the, the counter to it. If they believed, as he says here, the light of the gospel, the, the light, the illumination that comes from the good news, it would shine upon them. They would see it. Their eyes would be opened. Verse 5, he says, because we don't preach ourselves. Remember going, he's saying, our gospel's not veiled. It's not something that's exclusive to us. Verse 5, we don't preach ourselves. It's not about us. But we here's what we do preach. Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus' sake. So here once again, I, I have indebted myself to the service of Jesus and I come to serve you. Again, maybe one of the reasons why the objections against him, Paul is self-seeking, self-serving. Paul says, look, I'm here to serve you guys, not the other way around. So he's able to say this, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So as Paul kind of works through this argument, Again, the first part of verse 6, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts. So the same God who created all things and let light be has also revealed himself to us and we will shine forth that same truth. Now this, this is not such a unique thing to Paul, though it is between he and the Corinthians. Let's remember, step back for a second. We're reading a correspondence between Paul and a church at Corinth and the people who would be reading this letter. Those are the participants in this. We're looking at it from 2,000 years into the future, looking back at the things that were said. Now, this would be true of each believer, or it should be. If God has revealed himself to us and our eyes have been opened, the lights have come on, if you will, that's a matter and it's a work of the heart. It's a work of the spirit. It's a work of who we are. And that should be reflected in our lives as well. We project the same thing that is that has begun in us, that work that God has done. So what Paul would be able to say here, each of us should be able to say as well. So to look back at those six verses, his point is, our detractors may want to question all kinds of elements of our, of our ministry, but everything that we've done has been done completely out in the open. Nothing that we've done has been deceitful. Check it out for yourself. We will commend ourselves to the conscience of every person. Examine what we've said. Take a look at our lives. You'll find that there's not, we say one thing and do another. It's all there to be open. Now, that's a, a defense of his ministry. Now, the defense of his, men, his mission and his, his work, his message is also addressed here. He says there's nothing about our ministry and our message that is in any way veiled either. If it's hidden from their eyes, it's not because of us. We haven't made it exclusive to us. We come and we preach Jesus. Now, if they don't want to receive that, their eyes are blinded. The devil's given them something, and they're going to take the alternative, whatever it may be, possessions or the things that they want to indulge themselves. We know people will reject the message of Jesus for any variety of reasons. At the, at the core of it is that the devil wants them to have something that they find is more important than what is eternity. They don't grasp those things. So Paul's able to deal with all those. Now, <clears throat> so when we get to verse 7, then it becomes pretty obvious that his life is just different from, I think, pretty much anybody else that, that I can think of as far as the, the New Testament writers for what they endured um, after Jesus had resurrected, because we know so much about Paul's life between what we read in the book of Acts and then what we read in his epistles. He's, he's the central figure after Jesus in the New Testament. I don't think there's any real question about that. So this guy, you would figure if he's that prominent, I mean, try to think of it in, in the 21st century way. The most prominent, quote, Christian on the planet that we can think of would be Paul in this part of the world. Think about who that person might be in our days. And you might come up with a half a dozen different people. And look at how they're kind of celebrated among the church. Look at how they are, you know, they basically have rock star celebrity kind of, 
uh, kind of persona to them and everybody's so impressed by them. Well, Paul's kind of a different type of a, of a guy. These ones that might be the biggest of the big and the most recognizable of the, quote, Christians that we see, the big personalities, the most popular that there are, those guys don't suffer much. Their lives are pretty easy. They've got real, real comfort, real creature comforts in this world. Look at what Paul has to say and think about this. What he left behind was a place of prominence and, and real authority when he was really kind of doing the bidding of the Sanhedrin, of, among whom he may have been one. And he was on his way to imprison the church and those that he could find that were believers all the way in Damascus. So Acts chapter 9. A major thing takes place. He's kind of so zealous to do things in those early days that God basically gets him out of town and leaves him for more than a decade doing other things and then lays hold of him. And as uh, Paul would tell us that he had these three years that he spent where the Lord ministered directly to him one-on-one, -on -one, preparing him for what would, I, I believe, be his missionary journeys. Because he was going to use him as the most prominent man in the early church without question. And there's no real close second by all of the accounting that we have here. So with that said, look at what he ends up saying and then think to yourself, what would it be like to have to live this kind of a life? And I remember reading once, the um, somebody kind of did the numbers on it as much as they could from what we do know of his missionary journeys. But if you look at the amount of miles traveled in his journeys, they calculated them to be over 12,000 miles. 12,000 miles that he, that he traveled going from place to place in all of his journeys. And they looked at how much of it would have been on foot, and they, they calculated that to be over 5,000. That's amazing, or on land, you know, not by sea. But total 12,000, 5,000 of it was on land. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, I'm really pretty humbled by that. That's a pretty exceptional thing that you would spend that kind of time doing something that you're not really paid to do. It's that you do it because you're convinced of it. But look at what it cost him. Look at verse 7. Then This is amazing. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the earthen vessels is him speaking of himself. So he says, There's a treasure that we have, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So what God has done is placed in Paul this earthen vessel, placed in him this, this ministry, this understanding, this knowledge, everything that God has given to him. And really, anybody else should be able to say this as a believer. Same thing. We're all made of flesh and blood, and these, these bodies are, are going to decay to the point where they will return to the dust as they started. Okay, that's the earthen vessel. But there's a treasure that's been put in it. Whether we want to call that as simply as something like the, the, the Spirit of God who resides in us, but it's more than that because it's all about the testimony that we have and the knowledge that we've been given and how we are able to use that for the benefit of his kingdom, if it's teaching, if it's ministering to people's needs or whatever it may be, if it's the message, if it's evangelism, whatever it is that you do, these are the things deposited by God into the believer, these earthen vessels. And I love how he puts that. We have this treasure. God has put these vast riches into these earthen vessels, these temporal things. And so he's able to say um, that the excellence of, of the power may be of God and not of us, that he would receive the glory. He's the one who put it there in the first place. So anything that comes out of these earthen vessels that's of benefit to the kingdom, it's him that has caused them to begin with. I love this. And now look at what his life was like. And I mean, this is not him. Again, this is so cool because this is not one of those, woe is me. Look at my difficult life. It's not a complaint. Look at how he says this. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in a place of despair. So the perplexing <clears throat> is there's a, there's a you know, what, what's going to happen next? Not knowing for sure moment to moment. And again, every believer is just like this. We can, we can maybe know that God has work for us to do. In Paul's case, think about this. Paul was told at his conversion by Ananias that, that uh, God said, you, make sure he knows this. He's going to be used by me to proclaim my name between Jew, before Jews, Gentiles, and kings. So 
Jews and Gentiles, he can check those off his list, but he hasn't gotten to the point where he's gone before Caesar. He'll get to some lower magistrates here and there, governors and whatnot, when he gets to Jerusalem, still future down the road. But Paul realizes this. I know that there are things that are still going to happen because they haven't happened yet, but they were promised. So Paul may say there's a real perplexity to things. There's all kinds of pressures that come, and I don't know how to fix them, yet God does. So if you're a person who would say, I've got this perplexity. I feel like everything's crushing in around me, and I don't know what to do about it. Look at what he ends up saying. But we're not in a place of despair. Now, why is that? How can a person be so pressed in and filled with perplexity about what are we going to do next and not be in a place of despair? In Paul's case, he would be able to say, because God said, I still have things for me to do. So however I'm going to get out of this, it's not going to be dependent on me. It's going to be dependent on him. He will make a way. So distressing, I'm in, in, as he would say here, I'm pressed in, but I'm not crushed. I'm in a place of perplexity, but not in a place of despair. I haven't lost hope. So verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. So God has allowed him to be moved from place to place, always under the threat of death. Violence has been done to him and everything else. And yet he says, but I've never been forsaken. God has not abandoned me. These are things that really are going to, to make the make this man who he is. You know, enduring those kind of things. I have a feeling he's kind of one of those people is like, do your worst. And he's seen quite a bit of pretty horrible things. He knows what he's capable of. He told you that in, uh, when you read what he says in Philippians, the things that he used to do. Hey, if you want to talk about zeal, I had enough zeal that I was persecuting the church. So he understands that kind of intensity. But he carried that same intensity into his ministry and wanting to pursue the gospel and see it really kind of taken to the whole earth. He was the he was the right man for the task, and God tasked him to do this, knowing who he was. So he would say, I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm struck down, but not destroyed. And he would certainly know plenty of physical affliction. He had endured some pretty horrible things. But he says, but I'm not destroyed. It hasn't, it hasn't wiped me out. He says, I'm always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So Paul would say this. In the big picture, what do we know? We know that in, in the person of Jesus, they hated him so with such an intensity that he was put to death. But even though he was put to death, that was only going to be for a temporary, but for a very, very short time, because he was going to resurrect from the dead and he was going to bring life. By conquering sin and death, life is what ensued from that point on. So what would make a guy like Paul be able to endure the things that he did and, and what he endured? He says, I'm going to follow the example of what I saw in the person of Jesus Christ, and I will take it to my own self, my own body. I offer myself up. Even if it means to the point of death, that's fine. The same hatred they had for him, they have for me. But because he resurrected from the dead and because he lives, I will live. And as long as he wants me to do what I'm doing here, I'll be fine. The moment that he's done with me, he'll take me to be with him. Paul would talk about that to be, uh, it, for me, it's it's for me to live as Christ, but to die as gain is what he says, I think, also in Philippians. But his point is, it's great that I, you know, the, that I'm here, but if I'm not here any longer, that's totally to my benefit. It's wonderful because I'm going to be where he is. Now, if a person believes that way, even in a very incredibly hostile world, doing something that wasn't yet pr with any precedent. Paul was a, a trailblazer in this, of going into the Gentile world and preaching the gospel and doing what he did. He was really a one-of-a-kind guy. So he's able to, with all of that being said, I'm able to carry around in my mortal body the same kind of, uh, of forsaking of the day-to-day -day of things as Jesus did, caused a real hatred that people had for him, so they have for me as well. But because he lives, I live as well. This is what what makes him pursue and move on. So he says this, Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested or made known, revealed in our body. So we want people to know just as he went through it, so we go through it. And at the end of it all is eternal life. There's his hope. There's his confidence. In verse 4, 
For we who live are always delivered to death for his sake. People like him. Just every day could be your last, though Paul realizes, nah, I still got to go see kings. But at some point, after he's seen kings, he would realize, God can be done with me at any time. And so Paul may not be speaking specifically about him at this particular moment, but this is really said to all people who do as he does. He's able to say, for we live... For we who live all are, are always delivered to death for the sake of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh, following his example. We may very well be alive in this world, but we're under threat of death because of who we are and what it is that we believe. And that just makes the, the truth of what we believe shine that much brighter. So again, when you read these things, it's for us to look back in history and say, I understand what Paul is saying. I understand that that was his life. Most of us here in this world will never have to endure anywhere near this kind of persecution that he did. What I would hope is that we would all be able to bear under it with the same kind of integrity that he had here, realizing that we're here only for a time. And that's really going to be the rest of the chapter is going to be dealing with that kind of a thing. What we endure here is just for a time. Now, let's remember once again, if there were people that were talking about him as being dishonest or disingenuous or being self-seeking or doing it so that he could have accolades or maybe even riches or whatever else the case may be, Paul says, take a look at our lives. You think this is easy? What do we have to show for it? Other than the good news is proclaimed. And even if it means that we die, yet we live just as Jesus did. He lived he died, he rose again, and he's given life eternal. That's the whole of Paul's message. What has it caused him? Persecution, being crushed, being perplexed, or not crushed, but being pressed in, but not, not, not crushed. All the things he has just said. It gets him right to the point where some people might break, but he won't because God's for him. God is using him in these times. Let's remember this for ourselves, though, again, our experience will probably never be anywhere near his. We can still learn from these things. Do we, how quick are we to start to look for some way out or even throw in the towel once there becomes a little bit of difficulty? You can look to somebody like Paul and say, this guy went through an awful lot and yet look, look at how he endures these things and he does well in, in the whole process. So with that being said, verse 12, so then as he says, death is working in us, but life in you. So we're going through all the stuff so that you don't have to. Now, it may be tough for you as well, but Paul says we're able to take, if you will, the big arrows. Implied in this too is, how about those people who have been saying all the stuff about us and our ministry? What is it costing them? How about them? Do they serve you? Is there a concern for you? Do they have to endure difficulty and hardship to the point where some might even despair? For your sakes, we do. And it's not Paul trying to pat himself on the back. It's more giving a defense of the things that are being said about him and his motivations are completely wrong and they're, they're obviously in error. And so he's giving, if you will, a defense of why and why he does what he does and who he is and what they are to him. Again, it's a nice contrast about all those people. It's easy to go ahead and, and complain and throw rocks. But when the rubber meets the road, do these guys have to pay any kind of a cost as we've paid? Pretty, pretty, you know, stunning, stunning things. And again, the people who would read this in Corinth probably know 10 times better or who knows more than that, how much better they understood his reasoning here because of the things that had been said. So verse 13. Now, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, it says, I believed and therefore I spoke. And he's quoting from Psalm 116, uh, verse 10. And what he's saying is, I can have the same belief that the one who wrote the psalm, David. I have the same belief in him. And here's what that belief is. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I have believed and therefore I speak. So he's able to say, just as David said, same thing with me. This is what I believe, so this is what I will say. And the end of verse 13, we also believe and therefore we also speak. So his point is, I'm only telling you those things which I believe, just like David before, and he uses Psalm 116.10 to back up his point to it. Now, verse 14 says, Now knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus, 
I'm sorry, read it quick, slower. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Paul is wanting to make sure that he doesn't try to make this as there's you and then there's us. There's all of us together. The same thing of his hopefulness doesn't make him exclusive. The day is going to come when we will all be raised together and will be brought into the, the place of face to face with the Lord. That day is coming. So Paul doesn't try to make himself exclusive. I'm going to be raised. Paul says, this is my confidence. I believe this. This is what I speak because I believe it. I'll be raised with him and you will be as well. Really, really hopeful, really confident things. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. So everything that we've done of talking about the grace and the mercy of God, everything has been done for your sakes. And it's been done so that it would be for the building up and the edifying of this particular church. Having spread through many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. At the end of the day, and this should be said of all of us, and I'll say it as myself too, my ministry is nothing like Paul's clearly. But what I desire to do by teaching the Bible, my hope is that the people who hear it will take the message that they see from the text and hopefully if there's competency in the teaching, maybe revealing things to them that they hadn't seen before as we go through it. The, the Bible hasn't changed. I'm not seeing things here that have never been presented before. I'm just taking the text and we're, we're working through it and making sure that we understand what's being said here. If the resulting effect to that is that the people who hear it really come to an understanding about the intense grace of God and what he has actually done for us, that it should resound in us thanksgiving and gratitude towards God for what he has done. If that ever happens, even in one person in all of my time in ministry, then I would consider that to have been a successful thing. Paul's basically the same thing. Our message is one of what God has done and his amazing graciousness towards us in that he took the, the penalty of sin upon himself that we could be reconciled. If that comes across and people understand that, and, it re, and, and what it results in is thanksgiving and glory being given to God, then everything is exactly as it should be. Verse 16, So therefore, because of all of these things, it may be difficult, and yet at the same time, there are people who benefit from even all of our own personal difficulties. The ministry ministers to people and people's lives are changed. Clearly they were. Think about this. Add a layer to this. Remember, he is saying all these things to one church. He's saying this to one group of people. I don't believe for a moment that Paul had the slightest idea how far down the road we would still be here 2,000 years later and the things that he is saying are encouraging to me because I have yet to face, I can, I, I can say this with confidence, I'm, I'm trying to look back on 35 years, I can say that there's nothing that I've endured as far as a believer that would make me ask the question, is it really worth it, why would I want to go on? And I've never faced anything near what Paul has. So it's easy for me to be able to say, I've never faced any kind of adversity that makes me not want to do what I do. In fact, why would I want to do anything else? Because if I'm really convinced of the things that I'm saying, I'd have to crawl through broken glass to do them. Because what would be the reason to hold them to myself if God is really as good as he is? And if he's really as wonderful and, and loving and gracious and merciful as he is, what would ever prevent me from wanting to say that? Paul is in a different category than I'll ever be in because look at what he endured. And yet I catch a real, a real, you know, great gratefulness or gratitude in him of I don't care what I have to endure. Look what God has taken me from and look at what he has given to me. I think if every believer looked at it like that, we would never become, well, is it really worth it to me? Are you kidding? Is it worth it to you? Look at what God has given to you freely. Why would you ever have a problem with giving that back out? What has, what has he ever withheld from you that was necessary? Amazing. So Paul says this, Therefore, we don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
Notice this. He says this as a foregone conclusion. This is exactly what it's like. Everything on the outside, every single day that we age, we age and it's not getting better. Okay. So everybody is in a state of decay day by day. So the outward man is decaying. But what should be happening, notice he doesn't put a qualifier on this, for some but not for others, it's for every person, this is the potential. But the inward man is being renewed. It's going through renovation. That's what's being st uh, stated here. All the old stuff is being pulled out and taken out the bad things and the new stuff is being put in. That is the ideal. That is what is supposed to be happening. Now, there, there is also in this, we know from looking through the scripture or even looking at our own lives, we know that God wants to go in there and just tear everything out and put in all brand new stuff. We can prevent him from doing that. I just hope that we understand that. We can get in the way of his work. We can resist that work. Paul says, doesn't even give the, like, I'm not even going to acknowledge that that's a potential. Here's what is happening. Our outward man dying. It's decaying. The inward man being renewed. That, again, is the objective. It's the ideal. So each person should look at that and say, is that really genuinely going on? Every single day is God making strides and changing out the stuff, this renovation going on. And if you will step away and say it's really not happening, you got to look at look at yourself in the mirror and say, what am I doing that slows down the work? How am I getting in the way? Because God's capable, but he's not going to bully his way in and make you do things. That always means if that's not taking place, we have to look at ourselves and say, I'm somehow into some measure, I'm the cause of this. And then great, take corrective measures. Don't we want to see, even though we are decaying on the outside, but the inside is getting perfected better and better as God does the work? That's what we should want. So then verse 17. Again, this is, of the things that Paul says, I find myself quoting or, or thinking about this all the time because it's such an amazing statement. For our light affliction that is but for a moment, is working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. His light affliction? Are you kidding me? What we know of his life, just the things that are recorded, were dramatic. They were so difficult. His life was not simple by any stretch of the imagination. But he looks at it and he says, it's nothing. It's a light affliction. Now, he's using light in that way of saying, he minimalizes it. He kind of actually just says it's not that big of a deal. But I look at his life and go, man, I can't imagine what it would be like. The only way that you could take all of what he has gone through, and this is, I don't believe this is in any way some kind of false humility. I think this is him really reckoning. Because the only way that you could look at it as a light affliction, it's not a big deal, is if you really fully grasp what it is that awaits you. And so he talks about it like this. Our light affliction, it is but for a moment. That's his way of putting it in its perspective. It is what it is, but it's only for a time. Now, after that, when that short time is over, it's but for a moment, here's what it is. It is working in us an exceeding, uh, a more exceeding, that's a way of saying excessively excessive, an excessively excessive and eternal, that's why it's so weighty, weight of glory. So I can compare the two things. Light affliction because it's for a moment, but when I consider the eternity that's been giving to, given to me, it is excessively excessive in its weight and its gravity and the, the substance of it. The substance of our light affliction is so temporary, it's not even to be registered when we compare it to what is to be revealed. So if we can really ever grasp that, then no matter what it is that you're enduring, whatever you're going through and whatever the trouble may be, the recognition that there's an eternity that awaits the believer. Whenever it is that we get there, it helps us to endure the here and now because whatever it is that we endure, even if it's dramatic like his, if we genuinely understand what awaits us, we will look at anything that we undergo in this life and say, yeah, it's light affliction by comparison. And it's only for a moment, but when we compare that to eternity and what awaits us, there's just no comparison. There's no reason to look at our lives and say, woe is me. He doesn't do that. Again, this is said as he comes out of that defense. Here's what those guys have said. Here's how we conduct ourselves. They clearly must be conducting themselves in another way. Now he says, everything that we've done, we've done for the sake of what you guys have had 
for, for the sake of you guys and what we've talked to you about. We've gone through all kinds of struggles and whatnot for your benefit. And then at the end of it, Paul says, and don't think that we're feeling sorry for ourselves. Light affliction, because what's coming has such an enormous gravity to it. There's such a, a weight of its excellence that it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond measure. It's beyond recognition. So then verse 18. So while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, those are temporary. But the things which are not seen, now those are eternal. Once again, a very important thing for us to remember. When we take a look at the world around us, we're oftentimes taken in by the stuff that is seen. And it sometimes can be overwhelming, I know, at times. I'm reading the things that people say. They're watching the things happening around the world, and it seems like it's too much. This would be one of those great anchoring kinds of chapters to look at it and say, let's have the eternal perspective in light of the temporal. We oftentimes put way too much stock and pay way too much attention to the here and the now, but it's only for a time. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be 56 years old this year. I'm going to be honest. You could double my lifetime, and I guarantee you the first half of my life is going to be a heck of a lot better than my, the, than my last I, you know, I'm older and decaying. I mean, I'm watching my, my body fall apart around me. It's just part of the aging process. But my hope is not in this life and it's not in this world. It's not in this body. It's not in this existence. So whatever it is that we go through, <clears throat> that's just the stuff that we can see. But everything that we can see with our eyes, everything that's a part of this existence, man, it is temporary. Compare that to what awaits us. That is eternal. The scope of that is enormous. And it is for us to take heart and realize that God sees it all. He has it all in his hands. Now, what's even better than that? It's not as though once this life is over, then God's going to have to figure out what comes next. He's got everything for eternity already as a settled matter. The only thing that separates me from here and there is this life. I'm not in a hurry to get out of it. I'm not looking to, to check out. I'm not going to hasten those things. I'm going to be like Paul. As long as I'm here, he's got stuff for me to do. And I'll be busy about those things. But the idea that he has an eternity set in place for me and that it awaits me, I just have to, to lay hold of that once this life is over. Man, that puts everything in perspective. The things that are seen, temporal. The things that are unseen, eternal. But that's where our hope lies. It will take our eyes off of the day-to-day -day of things if... We can keep our, our minds focused on what awaits us with as much as we can grasp it. And our minds are pretty limited in that. I mean, try to grasp eternity. We're finite beings. We're here for a while. So it's really not an easy thing to try to grasp the, the full weight of what he is saying. It's what we know by faith, what we are able to reason and put together in our own minds. But it is, it is beyond, as he says here, it is excessively excessive the weight of the glory that is. So with that, I pray that you're encouraged. Maybe somebody who's listening to this today uh, may be going through some pretty awful stuff, maybe some really very trying, difficult times. It is always good to hear from somebody who says, yeah, I've been there. I've had my share of really difficult times. If you're not familiar with Paul, read his missionary journeys in the book of Acts or read the things that he talks about in his epistles. His was not an easy life, and yet he knew how he could have avoided all of it. He knows what it, what it would be to not have the same hassles and troubles, but that would also mean that he would not be able to do what God laid hold of him to do. He wasn't going to have any of that. I love this about him. He's just, he's like a hero to me as far as uh, men of the faith. So if you think that things are really difficult, just remember that there are others who have gone through horrible things. This man was going to pay with his life for what he believed. It was going to cause his ultimate death as we do, as we know the rest of the apostles did as well. Because they weren't going to back down on what they had to say. They had seen the risen God among us. What are they going to go back on? They're going to deny that just because of the threat of something right here and right now? Small price to pay that uh, these guys did what they did. And that's easy for me to say. I mean, I've never had a gun to my head of telling me to renounce who it is uh, that I believe in. So, with all that said, hopefully this is helpful to you. If you have any questions about what we've studied here, 
uh, feel free to contact us through the email. Uh, you can do that on the website, which is uh, oldpaththeology.net. And uh, make sure that you that you uh, like the um, the YouTube page. And if you do, you can subscribe to it. And um, if so, you'll know when we put up content. Or you always know, hopefully by now, that uh, Old Testament studies always go up on, on Monday evenings. And the New Testament studies always go up on Thursday evenings. So with all that said, I pray that this has been a blessing to you and that it helps you in your walk as you grow and you walk with the Lord. May he bless your pursuit after him and his word.